What's up, guys? Welcome back to Three Rounds with Daniel Cormier. So before we get into the fight today, I want to tell you that next week I'm going to Abu Dhabi for UFC 280. So there will not be a Three Rounds for that week. Be on the lookout for it the following. But to replace the guys, I got check-ins. I got check-ins with Islam, check-ins with Charles Oliveira, TJ Dillashaw, Al Jermaine Sterling, and Habib Nurmagomedov. So a big week from Abu Dhabi next week as we get ready for UFC 280. So next week, preempted, three rounds, but we'll, back, we'll be back the following week. Now let's get to the fight. I'm gonna show yeah. You yeah. Yeah. As we get into round one, I was talking about checking in with Habib Nurmagomedov, and as you know, Habib can say a lot of things. Well, in regards to the fight with Islam Mahashev's fight, with Charles Dubronx, Khabib said he expects Islam to roll through him, saying, quote, I think Islam's more skilled than Charles. Secondly, his experience as an amateur fighter. Also, he believes that Islam is at his peak because Islam isn't 23, 26, or 27. He's 30, turns 31 the week after the fight. It's the best time for any athletes. It's a state where your mental and your physical approach should be in synergy. Sometimes you're mentally strong, but your physical isn't down, isn't right. Sometimes your mental is great. Physical isn't. Physical is great. Mental isn't. When you're 27, you may feel great physically, but mentally, you're just not there yet because you're 27. Islam, he feels is at his peak right now, and he believes that he's overall better, of course. And this is the key in this quote, guys, because I saw all the, the titles and it said Habib expects to run through. Of course, there are some potential dangers that we're working on where Islam needs to be very careful. Other than that, I believe that Islam should roll over him. Why is that quote so important? I'll circle back to it. But Charles Oliver is on an 11 fight win streak. 10 finishes in those 11 fights. He has beaten guys like Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler. Tony Ferguson, the way that he kind of stalks these guys is like nothing I've ever seen. His opponent, on the other hand, Islam Mahashev, has won 10 in a row. Six finishes and has won the last four by finish. Guys, it's crazy because for a long time, Islam was thought to be a decision fighter. But as he has matured, those finishes are now coming. But I have to go back to that quote and tell you why. That part was so important to me. Because I know intimately how dangerous the team knows that Charles Dubronx is. Even though you expect something from your guy, because why wouldn't you expect that from your guy? You expect your guy to look like a world beater every single time, especially whenever he's fighting for his first UFC championship. But you also got to be very cognizant of what's in front of you. And I think that is where... Habib is saying, I understand the dangers. So they're spending more time working on those areas where they feel there is danger. And with Charles Oliveira, there's a lot of danger. A lot of danger. Because he's fantastic off his back. He's tremendous on his feet. And his confidence level is through the roof. I saw Charles Oliveira on Instagram today walking with a white tiger. Dude's at home in Abu Dhabi. This is a hometown crowd for Islam Makashev. This is a hometown fight for Islam. And Dubronx is just walking around there like he owns a place. This dude's got cojones. This dude's got big balls. <laughs> He's got big balls. He ain't afraid of nobody. If you think that Charles Dubronx Oliveira is afraid or nervous of what Islam Makashev brings to the octagon, you're crazy. But Islam is of that same belief. As Habib, because he believes that when he's on the ground, no matter who the opponent is, he can really impose himself on them, as we saw in this fight against Tiago Moises, who I think is the closest to a Charles Oliveira type fighter with the jujitsu skills, not the submission skills, though. 
But I know intimately, I know that in the camp, Islam's focused on all that Charles brings. And he recognizes that, very weary of that, and will be prepared for that. Does that mean he'll win the fight? I don't know. I'm telling you right now, this is the first time in a long time that I felt as unsure about a fight Islam Mahashev is going into than I am for this one this weekend. I truly believe, guys, that when we look at fights, the best fights the UFC can make right now, I think that this is the best one or one of the very best fights we can make because you're taking two guys that are in their absolute prime and you're matching them for the lightweight championship of the world. I'm all in. My flight leaves on Tuesday, and I can't wait to get to Abu Dhabi as I get to the 10-second mark. You guys, let me know in the comments what you think about Oliveira versus Makashev. It's going to be hot in the desert, and I can't wait to get there. Let's go. As we get ready for round two, I think we switch from lightweight, which is for a long time considered the best division in the UFC. But I think that the Bantamweight division is the best division that we have in, in the company. I think that that weight class and for the guys that are in that weight class is second to none. And next week we have a massive pay-per-view from Abu Dhabi, obviously headlined by Oliver versus Mahachev. But I think that the biggest storylines coming out of the fight right now or the fight card is the Bantamweight division because you got Aljo versus Dillashaw. And you got O'Malley versus Jan. So when you look at importance on a card, obviously the title fight is generally the story of the event. Definitely is true at lightweight, even though we do have Benil Daryush fighting uh, on the fight card himself. In another huge fight against, uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on the kid's name. Uh, is it Gamrod? I think he's fighting Gamrod. Yeah, he's fighting Mateos Gamrod next week. Massive fight with massive stakes. But lightweight's the, 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 the talk of the show, the show, the main event. At Bantamweight, it's a title fight, but the momentum that Sean O'Malley has built is amazing. His ascent, honestly, guys, has been like very few people that we have ever seen inside of the UFC. But... This is the biggest spot by far that he's ever competed in because he did fight against uh, he did fight against Pedro Munoz in Vegas. The fight ended in the way that it did. A lot was made of it. But then he said Peter Yan was the only guy that was available and he's the only guy that was willing to take the fight. But that leads me to this point. A lot of times when a guy's riding hot like this, not only does he carry the confidence, but the teams do too. And right now, you're starting to hear that out of the O'Malley corner, where his coach said there's a world in which he makes Piotr Jan look stupid. He feels that range, speed, the size of the octagon. He feels like all those things can allow for his pupil to make a guy outside of the Aljo fight that's been dominant looks stupid. I don't know if that's the case, but he is seeing something in Sean O'Malley that we aren't. Now, one thing he did catch was when he was speaking about all the training partners that are like Piotrian, he goes, he imagined Piotr is a step above those guys or he will look and feel a little bit different, which is the absolute truth. Because you can prepare for someone through training partners, but it's nothing like being in there with that person, regardless of how much those training partners try to make themselves into that guy. Because ultimately, they are not that guy. So if you're Sean O'Malley and his team, you take confidence from the training sessions, but also recognize that they aren't Piotrian. One factor in this fight that Piotrian has to really try to fix is he cannot start slow. He's traditionally a very slow starter. Cannot do that in this fight. He's got to go fast. He's got to try to overwhelm O'Malley early because, again, this is foreign to him because O'Malley has not been in this situation before. O'Malley has not been 
to the top of the mountain as Peorian has. But let's talk about the title fight. Al Jermaine Sterling is fighting against TJ Dillashaw, the returning champion. TJ never lost that belt. I understand all the things that come with TJ Dillashaw. The steroids, the suspension, everything that comes into question now because of what he did. Everything has to be questioned. It's just the truth. As much as it sucks, TJ's a good guy, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Everything is questioned. Al Jermaine Sterling is not afraid of questioning, but I talked to TJ yesterday, and he said to me, Al is trying to build excuses. He doesn't believe that Al Jermaine believes what he's saying. He thinks Al Joe is just trying to make excuses as to why TJ Dillashaw is going to beat him. It's a competitive fight as we get to the 10-second mark. Al Jermaine Sterling presents some very difficult problems for TJ Dillashaw, as does Dillashaw for Al Jermaine Sterling. Guys, this arena is going to be absolutely crazy next Saturday night. And I'm just lucky enough to be the guy sitting next to the octagon. All right, so as we get into round three and we get through Abu Dhabi, I always I start to question this, right? And I call it the rub because it's a wrestling term. And as you guys know, I was in the WWE just last weekend. So it is what it is. So I'm like in the business now. The rub means that you elevate someone else. And right now we have that going on in mixed martial arts. So how for y'all for Zeev is calling out Justin Gaethje. As a matter of fact, He's been calling out Justin Gaethje ever since he knocked out RDA. And so he was confused as to why Gaethje isn't giving him a response. So he's questioning, like, I keep calling out this guy. I keep calling out this guy. I'll give you a simple answer. How about y'all, Fazeev? He doesn't really have to. At least not yet. Right? At least not yet. So for Justin Gaethje, there's goodwill. In being as fun, everybody always goes, he's your favorite fighter, favorite fighter. This is not just a term we throw out. This is the truth. Justin Gaethje is that good. But for being that good, there's a lot of goodwill in that. So you get a bit of a say in what you're going to do going forward. He's also been one of the big dogs in the division. You know how they say lions eat first. You know the term, lions eat first. It's the truth. Justin Gaethje is a lion in the division. Competitive, com, sorry, competitively. God, I'm out here tripping, guys. Does it make a ton of sense? Absolutely. It makes all the sense in the world. Fuck, I can't believe I messed that word up, but whatever. C- competitively, it makes all the sense. I got it. I finally got it. But it's not always about just the competition because it's a bit of a weird circumstance because you got Fazeev who wants the rub. Gaethje, who's ignoring him, but doing the same thing with Conor McGregor. It's like the same thing. Because Justin wants to fight Conor because it's the money fight. But for Fazeev, fighting a guy like Justin Gaethje is the money fight. And it's the fight that propels you into something bigger. Now, in wrestling and fighting, this thing is very similar. You can always feel that young guy building. You can always feel him. You can can see him behind you. Like, you know that he's coming, right? But the time has got to be right before you kind of put him over. And when I mean put him over, I mean in wrestling, you get pinned by him. Or in fighting, you fight him inside the octagon. They got to be red hot. Like, they got to be red, like red hot. The way you touch him, it's it's hot. In the UFC, to me, it's got to be popular. The popularity has to match the skills, and then right when they're on the verge, you give them a name like Justin Gaethje, right? It's, it's booking one-on-one. That's why Fazeev fought RDA last, because he needed a name to start to propel him to the top. RDA was good, but I don't know if it gets him a Gaethje, because Fazeev is not there yet. He's there in terms of skills, but the recognition is not quite there. Dude's undefeated in the UFC, and he's as fun as they come. But he will not get a response from Justin Gaethje. He still needs one more. He needs one more big one that will make Gaethje 
perk up and go, okay, now's the time. Or Justin has to lose a bad fight. Right now, Justin hasn't lost a bad fight. Justin's lost fights, but he's lost fights that he's 50-50 or supposed to lose. Not many people favored him to beat Charles Oliveira. Not many people favored him to beat the guys that he's lost to. But every time he's in there with another big name that he's supposed to win, he wins the fight. So he still has that built-in goodwill. He's got all that money in the bank that allows him to go, why do I have to put this kid over right now? Why do I have to share the octagon with him? RDA does it because RDA is trying to make a beeline. But guess what, though? RDA had started losing. So if he wants to make a beeline back towards the top, you got to take on these young guys. Is it right? Not necessarily. But is it wrong for Gaethje to look at the pond of the lightweight division and go, wait a minute, I don't belong in the pond just yet. I can still fish in the ocean where the sharks swim because I can still catch some of these massive fights as I get to the 10-second mark. It'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. There's a lot of factors that goes into these situations. Fazeev's on the verge, but he needs that fight that's going to allow for him to break out. All right, now for my final thought. Juliana Pena and my thoughts on her title fight. So yesterday on DC and RC, I was talking about why I believe Juliana should not have gotten a immediate rematch. Guys, this is no disrespect to Juliana. I saw articles stating that I don't think the work is good enough. I'm not saying that what she hasn't done is not good. I'm saying that not everyone gets an immediate title fight. Can anybody fight Amanda as good as Juliana? I don't know. But there's also the fact that Amanda would have to say okay to fighting Juliana, knowing how tough it is. It's not going to be easy ever. There's a lot of factors into the opinion that I gave on yesterday. I don't know if Amanda will fight her right back, because why should she? Juliana Pena has had a tremendous career, and I respect her immensely. I just don't know if that's going to be the fight next, because there's just too many factors. So, Juliana, if I offended you, I apologize. But the reality is I had no intention of doing that. So y'all better stop twisting my damn words. Sure, I said the work. But I'm putting that in reference to what Amanda's done and what guys like Stipe did to get an immediate rematch with me and all these other great champions that get immediate rematches. But, hey, there's good in it because Glover Teixeira, right, fought Jan, Bo- fought Jan Bohovic, won the belt, fought against uh, Yuri Prohoshka, lost, and now he's getting a rematch. So maybe there's hope for Juliana. Guys, until next time, like, subscribe, tell your friend, to tell a friend that DC has a YouTube channel. And I'll see you guys in Abu Dhabi. And in the following week, we're back here with a brand new three rounds. Peace.